is getting people out of the. No. Good morning, everyone. Better than that. Come on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. And thank you to all those who repeated good morning back online. Uh, hello, my name is John Sproul. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm your service leader today. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. And welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I just wanted to note that we are one of two congregations in the Edmonton area. The other congregation, our sister or brother, or, or they congregation, um, <laughs> is, is with, is with uh, at Westwood Unitarian Church. And they have lots of activities going, and I encourage you to, uh, if you're new, to attend here, check out uh, um, work with our partners at, at Westwood Unitarian to be part of the Unitarian um, Edmonton community. And so for people here and online, whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you identify, you are welcome here today. Uh, and both of our congregations are located on Treaty 6 territory, and we'd like to acknowledge that and thank um, our Indigenous um, forefathers for allowing us to gather on this traditional <laughs> gathering place, which has been a gathering place for many millennia for diverse Indigenous people, including the Cree, the Blackfoot, the Métis, the Nakota Sioux, the Iroquois, the Dene, the Ojibwa, the Saltu, Ashinanabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. If I can ask everyone for a moment now to ensure that any device that you have on you is cell phones or noise emitting devices be silenced. We'll ask you as a noise emitting device to participate in hymns as we go forward. But please, if anything that is powered by a battery, if you could have that uh, kind of silenced as we go on. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. We hope you find something in the service today that nourishes your spirit and helps you find and keep your balance. And so now is the time we have three announcements um, just prior to the service, which is the most exciting part. Um, we first will have uh, Jan come up and give an announcement. Good morning. A few weeks ago we had a wonderful party here for Ruth Patrick for her 100th birthday and since then Louise Cherick and her husband Larry, well mostly Louise, but Larry did, Larry did, a, Larry did a lot of running around at, at her command and uh, I have this, she made this wonderful book about the event and Ruth's uh, uh, life and so we have it here at church for a few uh, weeks to look at before and after the service, so I encourage you to, to look at it. It's wonderful. Thanks very much, Jan. We have a second announcement from Donna. Donna. I'll get this right this time. Good morning, Donna Hammer. And um, I'm here to give you an update on the garage sale. So, in case you haven't noticed, we have posters, we have flyers, we have all sizes and shapes. Okay. <laughs> pick, pick, pick some up, several, post them around, give them to your friends, especially these little ones, and advertise that we are having our garage sale. So, um, we actually, um, um, well, first of all, I'm gonna thank my core team members. We have uh, a core team of uh, Ellen Logan, Rosemary Falconer, uh, Jan McMillan, Susan Rutan, um, Karen Belida, who's responsible for a lot of these, uh, David Hagel from the men's group, and myself. 
Um, the other one who actually is doing a lot of work, especially in printing of the posters and uh, maybe do, helping us do some delivery, is uh, Janet, our uh, uh, um, administrator. So um, please sign up. Sign up for a day, if you can, because we are going to have wonderful lunches. Kathy Stanley is Kathy Stanley is going to come and um, spend a week and a half here in Edmonton and is going to be sort of the lady in charge of the kitchen. So she will be uh, coordinating lunches, making lunches. If uh, but you also can offer to send up a, um, a lasagna, um, a homemade pot of chili, pot of soup, whatever. Okay, um, just a reminder that on Sunday, April 23rd, two weeks today, you can start bringing your um, treasures. One week. Oh boy, is time <laughs> flying. Oh boy. Okay, one week. So, tell your friends, tell your relatives, and we'll see you all at the garage sale. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and my pronouns are she and her and hers, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. My announcement is for Oksana Atwood, our Director of Spiritual Exploration, and next Sunday, right after church, she will be leading uh, one of our monthly spiritual exploration um, events. and. Uh, a group going to the Muttart Conservatory to go through it together, maybe have a bite to eat, uh, have a visit, uh, have some conversation, uh, get to know one another. So if you'd like to go, we need five people um, that, that wish to go to kind of make it viable. And so um, all you need to do is we'll meet, carpool, um, and then if you have a season's pass, um, you get in for free, but if you don't, it's, it, um, you'd need to buy a ticket. If there are uh, barriers to that for you, please let us know, and we can certainly get you in. We'll sneak you in somehow. Eh, I'm kidding. Um, so, yes, let myself or Oksana know if you'd like to go next week after church. It might be a nice bag lunch thing, too, if you want to bring your lunch. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks um, everyone. And uh, before we start to get into everyone's minds, a time of quiet contemplation and inspiration, we'll have a prelude, which Gordon told me what it was, but it's intermezzo, something Italian y Spanish y sounding. <laughs> and so please put your minds into you're in Europe or you're in Spain and you're wandering down the cobblestone streets and you're listening to this coming from a sidewalk cafe. So place yourself in the mind. <laughs>
Thanks very much, Gordon. And now we have our traditional chalice uh, lighting. And Louise, if you could uh, come up and um, light the chalice on behalf of the congregation. And I'll just say some uh, words. Um, oh, here. The, um, from Reverend uh, Dr. David Breeden. We gather into this circle. We gather into this circle of care to dream, to envision, to embody and achieve the compassion we dream, the justice we envision, the dignity of each in an ever-growing circle of love and justice. And if everyone could stand as you're willing and able to join in our opening hymn, 346, so you're not on your, you don't have to silence yourselves, just your devices. And come sing a song with me. Well, I haven't read a children's story in a while, so this, is, um, this might be a repeat for some. Is the book okay where it is? Are we going to put it on the screen? Yes, no? Okay, trying is good. So this is a story by, it's part of the Barnyard Collection. I've read these stories a few times. Click Clack Moo, I think, is probably the most famous book out of this series. And it's by Doreen Cronin and illustrations by Betsy Lewin. And this one is called Doobie Doobie Moo. And um, this is a uh, particip participation story. So there are um, cows and sheep and pigs and a duck. He's the duck. You guys, kind of like the last three rows or so, are going to be the cows. And you're going to sing Doobie Doobie Moo to Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars. But I think you'll have to practice. Are you ready? Doobie 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 Moo. <sighs> Try again. Doobie 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 Moo. Very good. The front two rows on each side will be the sheep. 
You're, you're the sheep. Yeah. Oh, I'm actually really wrong. You're the pigs. And you don't actually have a speaking part, but you have to do an interpretive dance. And so all you have to do, all you have to do is stand up when I ask you to and turn around. Pirouette, curtsy, whatever you like. You guys are the sheep. So Brandy, Susan, Mitch is row back. Ready? And it's um, home, home on the range to fa la 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 ba. Ready? Fa la 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 ba. Fa la 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 ba. Okay, we're getting there. And do you need to practice? Um, born to be wild. Do you need to practice, Gordon? You'll be spontaneous. Okay. All right, it's up. Great. Farmer Brown keeps a very close eye on his animals. Every night he listens outside the barn door. And the cows moo. Do. Very good. And the sheep. <laughs> okay. Try it again. It's just awful. Okay. <laughs> and then the duck. Okay. Okay. Gordon's into it. Okay. And duck keeps a very close eye on Farmer Brown. Every morning, Duck borrows his newspaper. One day, an ad captures his eye. Talent show. Open to all at the county fair on Saturday. First prize, a trampoline. Second prize, a box of chalk. And third prize, a veggie chop -a -matic. Uh, slightly used, sponsor makes no warranty, expressed or implied, nor assumes any responsibility in the use of the trampoline. Uh, actual amount awarded will be based on availability. Doesn't sound very promising. As soon as Farmer Brown opened his paper, he knew the animals were up to something, so they cut out. Farmer Va Brown watched them closely all day. He watched them from above. He watched them from below. He watched them upside down. Inside the barn, late at night, he heard Try it again, try it again. And he heard the sheep. Excellent. He even watched them upside down. Inside the barn, the cows rehearsed Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. You don't have to do it again. But it needs work, Duck noted. I noted that too, actually. The sheep rehearsed home on the range, and Duck had them try it again with more feeling, just as I did, because you guys were awful. Okay, the pigs did an interpretive dance. <laughs> as, you're, as you're willing and able. <laughs> These guys did it way better than you. <laughs> okay. And whack a whack a quack, snored Duck. <laughs> day after day, Farmer Brown kept a very close eye on the animals. He watched from the left, he watched from the right, he even watched in disguise. Outside the barn, night after night, he heard dooby 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 moo and fa la 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 ba. Very good. And he heard. Excellent. <laughs> they are up to something, thought Farmer Brown. Farmer Brown was not going to leave them behind, so he, help, he hauled all of them up into the truck and drove to the fair. When he got there, he heard them singing some more of their songs. I won't make you do it again right now. I won't, but I will later. He parked his truck and headed off for the free barbecue. Soon as Farmer Brown was out of sight, the animals ran to the talent show desk and signed in. They signed sheep, pigs, cows, sheep, and pigs. And then there's some small printing here. 
Contestants consent to the use of his, her name, photograph, and or likeness for advertising and promotional purposes in connection with his promotion without additional compensation unless prohibited by law. <laughs> the cows say, so here you are, you're on stage now. Rehearsal is all over and the cows are on stage. So, ready? Doobie, doobie. And now the, the sheep, oh, pardon me, two of the judges were clearly impressed. The cat gave you a 1.2. The, the sheep sang Home on the Range. <laughs> You're not going to win. Three of the judges were clearly impressed. It was time for the pigs interpreting interpretive dance, but they were sound asleep. So now you have to snore. Okay, perfect. All of the judges were clearly annoyed. Duck really wanted that trampoline. He jumped on stage <laughs> and sang. <laughs> the, judges, the judges gave him a standing ovation. When Farmer Brown got back to the truck, he heard them singing once again, and they were exactly where he had left them. That night, Farmer Brown listened. Dooby, dooby, boing. Fa la la la, boing. Wah, wah, wah. Boing. boing. They won. The events and characters depicted in this picture book are fictitious and similarity to actual persons, living or otherwise, is purely coincidental. <laughs> Thank you for playing. <laughs> no, no animals were harmed, that's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just see a barnyard out there now. <laughs> But uh, actually, if the ushers, um, it's now actually uh, time for uh, sharing of our abundance. And so if I could ask the ushers to, to help with uh, that activity. Our community, the Unitarian Church, is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. And one of the privileges of this church tradition is to provide all the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. And therefore, generosity is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our own personal as well as our institutional and community well-being. So in addition to supporting this church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. And one half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. Some are local, some national, some international. And for the month of May, it's an international organization, but it was really spawned out of the aspirations of some great Edmonton Unitarians, and that is Child Haven International. And if people wanted to find out more information on that, it's in, in the, they can see that in the lobby. For those in the sanctuary, you can use the, a um, uh, lot of people uh, do online um, uh, regular kind of uh, donations. Um, just wanted to note that. And uh, tax receipts can be gotten from a little form in the back of the, the hymnals books. Uh, the offering plates, um, I'll just wait for a moment, and um, the offering plates can be brought up uh, here. And we want to thank everybody for their generosity uh, and support. And uh, with our time and talents and our money, we support the work of the community and the Unitarian Universalist tradition. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks very much. And as part of the ongoing service um, committee's adjustments in the service, I, I know I have to give a service leader reflection. Um, I don't have to.
but I welcome the opportunity. And I only have a few uh, kind of short remarks, say, based on the theme, strong too long, resistance is not futile. And basically where my mind wandered, where I was thinking about this particular kind of topic. So it'll all come together in the end. But when I first read the title, and I thought, resistance is futile, and my mind immediately went to pop culture and to Star Trek, and the famous line from that of resistance is futile. And that context is what was said by the Borg, a gigantic evil creature which would take over ships and planets and populations, and it was often it, uh, have alien, half alien, half machine, and it took over humans and converted them to be part of one single brain with thousands or millions of tentacles. And so they took over the human minds and they would mutter as they took it over, resistance is futile. And I thought uh, then of what I do in my own work and my general demeanor is always to be a questioning devil's advocate and resist the Borg that exists in my life from all uh, political ideologies, left and right, but organizations I work for. And I think it's, uh, I'm resistant to Borg-like mindsets of any kind. I think we always need to explore why people think differently than we do. And that is why I like science and evidence and facts, um, but realize that evidence changes. Um, and we should always be constantly in a learning mode and be very careful about getting trapped into dogma and set positions without being open to new ideas. And I think that happens all the time. Uh, I also was immediately struck when I remembered Star Trek, actually, of some interesting things I've been exposed to of some subversive resistance related to Star Trek. Because um, I had organized a forum a number of years ago around it was a national one around healthcare and medicine and how it was portrayed in popular culture. And I happened to connect with some producers of the Star Trek series and heard a lot of background information. And they actually had ongoing advisory boards from the humanities and scholars and from scientists and planted quite progressive themes through their series all the way through up until today. And you could be quite controversial without being controversial when you were talking about foreign planets, actually, and societies that lived off that weren't human. And so the first kiss between a white and a black person was on Star Trek on television, uh, O'Hara and, and Kirk, which was not groundbreaking because it was t talking about being in the future. And there was an episode uh, in a Star Trek, which the, one of the producers told me about, which was about this spread of disease that echoed public health concerns at the time around creating tolerance for AIDS in society. But Star Trek was doing these stories about kind of distant planets and sending particular messages. One, there was a planet portrayed uh, in the, one of the secondary series where only same-sex marriages were allowed. That was the, the culture of the particular planet. And then all of a sudden, there were these two people of distant genders who fell in love. And the story was about them, of how they were ostracized by society and not be able to kind of cope. And it was this wonderfully, it was written with the National Institutes of Health advising them on how they would kind of present it. So I thought it was a very clever program of, of subversive kind of messages. And I think both art and science which are two things that I'm involved in, can be actually quite useful as subversively talking about other worlds. And after my Star Trek musings, I thought about experience I had as a, as a coach with the National Track and Field team about being strong and thinking about the theme of taking time and recovery and not being strong all the time, but building strength, which involves both being strong and actually not being strong, and it's well documented how our bodies and ourselves need breaks and rests, and that's how people learn. And people learn and progress quite differently. Um, that's another thing I learned. I had to deal with quite different techniques when I was coaching various people in order how they would excel. Some people needed actually to get a gentle, and sometimes not too gentle, kick in the butt, frankly. Albeit, the evidence shows that persistent, tough love approaches are generally not a good long-term strategy. Uh, some people need to be told how wonderful they are 
and bolstered up constantly with praise. Frankly, it was mostly men who seemed to be constantly <laughs> respond, who seemed to respond very well to praise. I don't know if people have experienced that. And others need to just be given some logical arguments. So part of it is, is I learned about recovery, but also people learn and progress differently. But the key thing in achieving anything was regularly scheduled periods of recovery. You could not constantly be exercising maximum effort or putting strain on yourself. The body was adapting. You needed to stress it. And then during the recovery stage, you were not doing nothing. Your body was adjusting and healing and resetting to the stress it had received. So when you're doing nothing, you're not actually doing nothing. When you give yourself a break, you are resetting. Now, if you're just doing nothing all the time, then I think you need to perhaps be coaxed out a bit of to try and move forward to kind of the stress, recover, stress, recover prompt. But I do think we need, because I do think we need to be cautious about becoming victims to our own circumstances, but have pathways to kind of move forward that one small step. And so as a health researcher, I do have a bias uh, that the main focus as we kind of move forward and kind of achieving kind of optimal improvement is education. Actually, it's the silver bullet. Uh, we need to flip our intervention focus, frankly, on aging and chronic disease and to the root causes of ill health that really start early. And I was always struck um, by about what some soci how some societies are healthier than others. And there's some really seminal research that was done that saying, oh, let's look at all these societies. What is it that is a root common characteristic that makes healthier outcomes with society? And it wasn't money. It wasn't, wasn't all sorts of things that you might think. It was female literacy. Because when you had a society where women were educated, it showed a lot about the particular society in terms of their status, in terms, terms of that. And countries which had high degrees of female literacy were generally better in terms of, of health outcomes. And just as a kind of a final thought, when I was thinking about vulnerable and being kind of strong and, and adapting, there is a, a movie which I'd encourage everybody to read, which is a, about a boy, which was Hugh Grant was in with a kind of a young kid who kind of had some challenges. And Hugh Grant had challenges as a rich guy who was idle and didn't know what he was going to do. And then there was a mother, too, who had a son who had some chronic mental illness. But, and the boy kind of navigated between it. But the key issue was you needed backup, frankly. And so I think connecting with others and having some particular backup, whether it's a church, whether it's a particular community, whether it's that is really important. And in thinking about that, I was thinking about the backup doesn't always necessarily have to pe have people who are current. Sometimes it can be backup from people who you have lost and learnings that you've had. And I do remember actually my parents, which, which taught me a lot, and my father, when we had his funeral service, we had put forward a thing in the back, which was a quote from Winnie the Pooh, which was, if ever there is tomorrow when you're not together, there's something you must always remember. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. But the most important thing is, even if we're apart, I'll always be with you. So. My rambling message is resist the Borg. Mm -hmm. Recovery is an active part of any endeavor. The best future is ongoing empowerment and you need backup. So that is my reflection and I'd like uh, everyone to join in the next hymn, which is uh, hymn 331, Life is the Greatest Gift of All.
Thank you, John, for that wonderful reflection. Strong too long, resistance is not futile. Uh, the reading I have chosen for this morning is from the book Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good by Adrienne Marie Brown. The book is a series of essays commenting on an original essay by Audre Lorde. Not exactly sure how to say her name, I apologize. Uh, the, the essay I am reading um, in, in part is on uh, a, the chapter titled Love as Political Resistance. Audre Lorde taught us that caring for ourselves is not self-indulgent, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. And although we know how to meme and tweet those words, living into them is much harder. We have a deeper socialization to overcome, one that tells us that most of us don't matter. Our health, our votes, our work, our safety, our families, our lives don't matter. We need to learn to how to practice love such we need to learn how to practice love such that care for ourselves and others is understood as political resistance and cultivating resistance, resilience. We don't learn to love on a linear path. We learn to love by loving. We practice with each other on ourselves in all kinds of relationships and right now, we need to be rigorous in practice because we can no longer afford to love people the way we've been loving them. What we need right now is a radical, global love that grows from deep within us to encompass all life. No big deal, right? To help make this a true day of love, here is a brief radical love manifesto. She says, we begin learning to lie in intimate relationships at a very early age. We lie about things to avoid punishment. We are taught different ways to love. Some love one way, some another. We have to lie to impress or catch one another. We also learn that love is a limited resource and that the love we want and need is too much, that we are too much. We learn to shrink, to lie about the whole love we need, settling with not quite good enough in order to not be alone. We have to engage in an intentional practice of honesty to counter this socialization. We need radical honesty. honesty learning to speak from our root systems about how we feel and what we want. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of what she says. She talks about trauma and shame, about how trauma and shame are part of most everyone's life. She said, suggests that we end up carrying these traumas inside of us and that trauma has become normalized in today's society. But however, Healing has not become normalized in today's society. She goes on to offer the idea of being healers and helpers to one another, that the expectation in our systems should be, I know we are all in need of healing, so how are we doing our healing work? So how do we do that? She offers us this. Shift from individual transactions for self-care to collective transformation. Be in community with healers in our lives. And healers, we must make sure our gifts are available and accessible to those growing and changing our communities. Be in family with one another. Offer the love and care we can. Receive the love and care we need. Let our lives be a practice ground where we're learning to generate the abundance of love and care that we 
as a species are longing for. Commit to developing an unflappable devotion to yourself as part of an abundant, loving whole. Make a commitment with five people to be more honest with one another. Heal together. Change together. And become a community of care that can grow to hold us all. And that's the end of that quote. It's one of the books that are um, in our Soul Matters packet that are considered to be kind of um, foundational for this theme of resistance this month. Shortly before I was headed down to Indiana to do my first gig as a newly minted minister, I was at a minister's gathering, and the wonderful Reverend Fran Dearman said to me, when you, what you're going to need when you get there is self-care, self-care, self-care. Practice self-care until it begins to feel indulgent, and then add a whole bunch more. First of all, why would self-care feel indulgent? Perhaps it is because that we live in a world that suggests to us that we need to value sacrifice, endless giving, working long hours to get ahead, and we need to do those things within systems that promote rugged individualism. Adrienne Marie Brown suggests to us in her book in general and in this essay in particular, that being active in a community that promotes deep relationships, honesty, healing, support, and loving care is an act of resistance. We are, by our mere fact of being here together this morning, practicing resistance and resilience. We are saying, by voting with our feet, I don't want to live in isolation from another, from one another. I want to be in a community where I can practice love and care. I want to be part of a larger community that does good things in the world, like the UUA and the CUC. That's pretty darn radical, if you ask me. Here's an even more radical thought. What if we decided we were enough? What if we woke up one day, tomorrow, this morning, and decided that we didn't need to agonize over those last 10 pounds, or firm up before we put on our bathing suit and went swimming, or were worthy of the love we desired? Imagine what would happen to the beauty industry if we all simply stopped buying into the beauty myth. The, you need to be better than you are, and the, and we can help you, industry, is a multi-million dollar industry relying on us to be dissatisfied with the way we look. And further to that, perpetuate the lie that unless we do look in a particular way, we are insignificant. Now, don't get me wrong. I like going and getting pedicures and getting my hair done just as much as the next person. So I'm preaching to myself as well. But let's just stop for one second and say to ourselves, right here, right now, I am enough. Can you say it with me? I am enough. I and you do not have to do one single solitary thing to be worthy of love and belonging. Just thinking those words is an act of resistance in itself. What would it take for you to think of yourself as whole and lovable just as you are? What would it take for you to believe that you are whole and lovable just as you are? I took this great class in seminary called Women Mystics Down Through the Ages, or I think that was what it was called, and we studied all these women mystics. I was drawn to a mystic from France 
who was executed in 1310 for heresy. Her name was Marguerite Porette. Her book was called A Simple Mirror. She considered herself to be a reflection of the divine, a reflection of God in 1310. God was ever present in everyone's life. In learning about her, and I read, her, read parts of her book, and just think, it's 1310, she died. She published a book. Think about that for a second. So we were all in class this one day when we were studying Marguerite. Uh, we were all given this little mirror. Now, of course, we wouldn't need to do that because we have our phones and we can just flip it to our faces for a selfie view. Uh, so we were uh, asked to sit with this mirror and look at ourselves until we could see the divine looking back at us. So we had to sit there. I put, I, we were also given a bit of netting because it's fairly intense. So try it sometime. So we had a, I put a little bit of netting over it. That was where we started. And then she said, okay, take the, take the netting off and look at your face properly. I found the exercise pretty darn uncomfortable. Me, a humanist, thinking of myself as part of the great mystery, as part of the divine. But of course I am. And you are too. How radically resistant was Marguerite that she could think of herself as part of what she would have seen as God. In those days, thinking like that is heresy. And she was burned at the stake for having those thoughts and writing them down. We, in this day and age, can have radically resistant thoughts like, I am lovable. I am part of the great mystery. I can be who I was meant to be. I can live into my true self. I can live out my life in community and not buy into the rugged individualism that is being foisted upon us. And we can learn to say all these things and we won't get into trouble. So have you heard me talk about congregational life as a rock tumbler? No? Oh, I'm slipping. Okay. Um, so one of the uh, analogies I like to use for congregational life is the rock tumbler. We are all kind of like rocks, dirty, messy, rough. We might have potential. And so we hop into the rock tumbler where the work gets done to make us shiny and beautiful. In the rock tumbler, all our grit, rough edges, chips on the shoulders are worked off by smashing into each other. We bump up against one another by having conversations, some heated. We get annoyed with one another. We wish things were different. We wonder why so-and-so isn't better at this or that, and then we discover if we wait long enough and allow ourselves to engage over and over and over, beauty emerges. So that's our job in the rock tumbler, to bring the beauty out in one another. We show up. We do the work, we pull our weight, we sing the song, we give a reflection, we play the piano, we do the things up in the booth and online. And every time we bump into one another, every time we offer a smile, a kind gesture or word, you are building resilience in the system and you are engaging in an act of resistance. For society tells, it, tells us that we have to go it alone. We have to buy what we need instead of sharing what we have. And we must live in such a way to maximize our individualism and our consumerism. But we can't get beautiful when we do that. Although you already are beautiful, just saying. We need one another so that we can get shiny. 
and it's loud. Have you ever heard a rock tumbler? It's loud. It's messy. And it hurts sometimes. And if we decide to avoid the rock tumbler, as in avoid the difficult conversation, avoid learning a new skill, avoid trying something out of our comfort zone, avoid engaging, we are missing out on the opportunity to become shiny and beautiful. So the risk of going it, alo going it alone is that we miss out on all the wonder and delight. It's only the rock that gets tumbled that is shiny. So how do we go about doing that? <clears throat> Adrian Marie Brown gives us a lot of clues. We need to become a community of care that can grow and hold us all. We could ask the healers in, the, in our midst, because I know there's many, to help us. Or perhaps we could be clear to newcomers how to get involved without being overzealous or even more radical, make room for newcomers to get involved. Resistance in this context means doing the things that promote community by engaging in hospitality, visiting with one another, helping one another, and the really big thing, asking for help when you need it, because nobody's a mind reader. Sharing food and experiences and attending and supporting the services, events, and activities presented here, like the event next Sunday. We've been strong too long. We don't have to go it alone. Pushing back on the desire to be a lone wolf is in itself an act of resistance. Resistance is not futile. And I invite you to engage fully in this community. For it's very true that you get out what you put in. Let's learn together how we can help each other be better, be shiny, be healthy, and be vibrant. Sometimes it feels like we've been strong too long. Sometimes it feels that life isn't fair. And sometimes we need to ask our community to help us. Other times we feel strong and we can be there for others in the community. I would like to invite all of you sometime later today to just take a 15 minutes out of your day this afternoon or maybe tomorrow, settle into a chair, get out your phone or a small mirror, and look in and plant your feet on the floor, take a couple of deep breaths, and look at yourself. Continue to look into the camera or the mirror until you can see someone that reflects back to you love and care and perhaps even a glimpse of that great mystery. When I look out, I see a group of loving and caring people that desire to be in community. I see a lot of beauty. And in conclusion, I offer this quote by Robin Wall Kimmerer. In a consumer society, Contentment is a radical proposition. Recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires. Gratitude cultivates an ethic of fullness, but the economy needs emptiness. So let's find contentment in one another and become a community of care that can grow to hold us all. So may it be. And amen. And now we're going to watch a video of hymn number 108. You can hum along, sing along. I've watched this several times, and every time I see something new and interesting. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. It is simply for your enjoyment. Mm-hmm. 
continue in a spirit of meditation. I invite you to take a couple of deep breaths with me. A 
allow your foot, feet to plant themselves on the floor if you like, or rest into the couch or the chair or the bed if you are at home. I offer you these words by Anne Lamott. Oh my goodness, what if you wake up some day and you never got your memoir or novel written? Or you didn't go swimming in warm pools and oceans all those years because your thighs were jiggly and you had a nice, big, comfortable tummy. Or you were just so strung out on perfectionism and people pleasing that you forgot to have a big, juicy, creative life of imagination and radical silliness and staring off into space like you did when you were a kid. It's going to break your heart. Don't let it happen. Repent just means to change direction. And it is not to be said by someone who is waggling their forefinger at you. Repentance is a blessing. Pick a new direction and aim for that. Shoot for the moon. A few moments of silence and Gordon will bring us out of the silence with, and we will sing him 1053, How Could Anyone? Sundays in most congregations. We take a few moments and light a candle of joy or concern. We do this to help us mark those occasions of our lives, those hurts, those sorrows, those disappointments, those joys, those exuberances. I invite you now to take a candle and light, take a taper and use it to light um, you know what to do. If this is your first time, don't go first. Follow along.
Gordon for that beautiful music. John is lighting an extra candle, a final candle for all those joys and concerns that we hold in our hearts. That may, we may not even know, the thought may not even yet be finished. And now we come to the end of our service, and I invite you to sing hymn number 1030, See Yahamba. We'll sing both the English and the, the um, Zulu. Uh, does anybody need me to go over the pronunciation of that? I was afraid you'd say that. Okay. <laughs> See Yahamba, Kukinen Kwenkos. See Yahamba, Kukinen Kwenkos. See Yahamba. Kukin and Quencos. Oh, it's all the same. See a humbug, Kukin and Quencos. We're good. All right. Let's, uh, let's give it a whirl. And please rise in body or in spirit, please. <laughs> pronounced it all perfectly. I don't know what was your problem with you guys. <laughs> but now we come to the end of our service and um, thank you, Louise, if we could ask you to extinguish the uh, flame as I say these words uh, by Mark Bellatini. Uh, Go in peace, live simply, at home in yourself. Be just in your work, just in deed. Remember the depth of your own compassion. Do not forget your power in the days of your powerlessness. Do not desire with desire to be wealthier than your peers and never stint your hand of charity. Practice forbearance in all you do. Speak the truth or speak not. Take care of your body, be good to it. It is a good gift. Crave peace for all peoples in this world, beginning with yourselves. And go as you go with the dream of that peace set firm in your heart. Amen. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in and contributed to this service. Thank you, John. Excellent service leading and Gordon, the piano, tech people, people at home, people in the sanctuary, people in the future. Oh, everybody, thank you. And I offer you these words of benediction that have now become familiar to most of us. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break and things can bend, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So go and love intentionally. 
love extravagantly and love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you, that is you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. Let us join together in singing our linking song, Carry the Flame. <laughs>